My name is Annie Kim. I'm the Assistant Dean for Public Service here. And it is my distinct honor to introduce today one of our most truly distinguished alumni working in public service, the Attorney General for the District of Columbia, Carl A. Racine. Since I know you'd probably rather hear from him than from me, I will keep my introduction brief. Mr. Racine was born in Haiti and immigrated with his family as a child to the United States to flee the authoritarian government in Haiti. He's been a lifelong resident in the district since then. He attended college at the University of Pennsylvania and then came to Virginia Law in probably one of the most prescient moves of his career. <laughs> During his time as a student here, Mr. Racine made his first foray into public service by volunteering with the then Migrant Farm Workers Rights Clinic. And that, that clinic survives and is thriving still at the Legal Aid Justice Center. Following graduation, Mr. Racine joined the law firm Venable at its DC office. And after three years of litigating at the firm, he then joined the Public Defender's Office into the District of Columbia, which many of you know is the preeminent public defender agency in the country. Following his time there, Mr. Racine returned to private practice, this time with the firm of Kacharis and Treanor, and doing white collar criminal defense and commercial litigation. Now the next turn in his career path led directly to the White House, to the White House General Counsel's Office during the second Clinton administration. And he was there and served at the time of the, uh, the impeachment proceedings, so a historical moment there. Mr. Racine then returned after this service to Venable, where he quickly went on to become the firm's managing partner, heading up a practice of over 600 attorneys, and also becoming the first African-American managing partner of a top 100 law firm. He was also recognized at that time by the National Law Journal as one of the 50 most influential minority lawyers in the United States. As many of you know, in January 2015, Mr. Racine took office as the District of Columbia's first elected Attorney General. And this resulted after a vigorous race that culminated in a high, record high voter turnout in the district. And as Attorney General, he heads up an agency of roughly 230 attorneys. And they advise the district's executive branch and other agencies. You'll hear a lot more about the work there in a few minutes. So please, please join me in welcoming Mr. Racine, the Attorney General for District of Columbia. All right. Well, look, uh, it's really an honor to be uh, back at the University of Virginia School of Law, a uh, place where, you know, I had it really an extraordinary experience uh, back in uh, 1989 is the year that I graduated, just 10 years before your terrific dean, Dean Kim. And thank you for your kind words, Andrew, and I appreciate your uh, courtesies in, in getting me down here. Um, I got to tell you, I'm going to go into my talk and let's make a few deals, okay? Number one, first deal for me, I'm going to be absolutely honest and totally candid uh, with you on any questions that you might inquire about. Uh, some of what I say, you know, may, uh, may not be so positive about various experiences that I've had in my life, um, but we'll just shoot straight. And I really want you to feel very comfortable uh, in regards to, again, asking any question. You know, we can talk about public service and private practice, uh, as well as other issues that are uh, important to you. So I want to make this certainly less about uh, me and perhaps more about you and what it is you might want to do uh, in your lives and, and how my own experience might help you and help your thinking in that regard. Um, I can tell you uh, one thing you should certainly leave here uh, knowing uh, is that I had no idea when I came down to UVA in 1985 uh, as a uh, first year law student uh, that I was even going to graduate from law school, work for a private law firm, be a public defender, and certainly go on to do other interesting things. I just really didn't know uh, that that was out there uh, for me. Um, as, as we know, UVA attracts an extraordinary caliber of, uh, of law student, and I'm sure that I couldn't get into the school today. Uh, but back in that day, there were some exceptional uh, law students as well. Um, I must tell you, my first experience when I came down here in uh, 1985 and attended the University of Pennsylvania. Anybody from Philadelphia? It's a great town. Um, attended the University of Pennsylvania for college, 
And uh, the University of Pennsylvania was very um, diverse. I mean, you know, of course, you know, it was in an urban environment. The school itself had done a lot uh, to attract a pretty global uh, community of students as well as professors. Um, and I, I loved Penn. I came down to UVA and knew a lot about UVA. Many of my friends went to UVA undergrad. But I came down to UVA and I was struck um, and, and pretty stunned, quite honestly, at what I found to be just a complete lack of diversity. Um, and uh, I really considered uh, in my first weeks uh, calling up the folks at Penn. I'd gotten into Penn Law School and a bunch of other law schools um, as to whether you know, I might get back in there uh, even a couple weeks late, um, but uh, determined to suck it up. And uh, really, it was just an extraordinary, um, definitely an extraordinary experience. And frankly, it stretched my bounds um, as to what diversity meant um, to me. Um, and certainly, I was concerned, of course, about uh, what I saw, which was you know, just a handful of, of uh, folks of color, um, even fewer people who were of Latin American or Hispanic descent, very few Haitian, excuse me, Asian folks, only one Haitian. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, it, it challenged and pushed me because what I found in the student body, notwithstanding colors, hues, you know, um, places of uh, geographic birth, um, was a student body nonetheless that certainly um, had a great range of diverse thoughts, beliefs, um, and ideas. Uh, and so I reveled in that. And it really caused me to you know, push my own expectations, beliefs, and biases as to what a truly diverse community should look like, act like, think like. Um, at any rate, that was an early divergence from my prepared remarks. <laughs> so look, here's what I pr propose to do today. I propose to uh, talk a little bit about my personal background. I've heard a lot about that. Um, talk about uh, being an attorney general in the District of Columbia. Um, talk about the unique structure of government in the District of Columbia. It's really fascinating and unbelievably archaic that Congress can still run the show in the District of Columbia. Um, talk about some of the things that you know we're focused on uh, in my office in terms of our priorities. And then really just open it up to you. So I'll try to be as brief as I can on background stuff. Uh, and so we know that my family was um, Haitian. Um, very briefly, my father was the mayor of his town, a town called Quadabouquet. Uh, that's where Wyclef is from, so now people know it. Um, <laughs> back in the day, it was like, yeah. <laughs> but uh, uh, yeah, my mother is an extraordinary human being, my dad as well. Uh, my mom was always um, an educator, and, uh, and so we, we grew up in Haiti, my entire family. My, my parents were always politically active, and certainly in Haiti, that was a dangerous uh, business to be in uh, back in uh, 1960 and 65. Uh, the then president, Papadoc Duvalier, didn't have much tolerance uh, for dissent. And so members of our family and a lot of friends were uh, routinely you know, uh, hauled up and went missing, and some were even killed. And so it was really that motivation that caused my mom and dad to leave Haiti, as my mother always says, she was not going to raise her kids in an environment where they would either be punished and killed for speaking their mind or would have to choose just to remain silent in the face of just you know, great oppression and um, gross injustice. Uh, so they left uh, Haiti. I came to the United States. They left us, my sister and I, uh, with our, uh, our grandparents and uncles and cousins and the like. And we would later join them in Washington, D.C., uh, three years later, uh, so until they got settled. My mom uh, got settled pretty easily, so she had applied for and was admitted to the Georgetown University Ph.D. program in foreign languages and linguistics. That's what she did. My dad, it was an older man relative to my mom, 
you know, really it was a sort of a, a silent hero in the sense that he kind of had things going pretty well for him in Haiti. He had you know, a couple of businesses. He was the mayor of his town, very committed uh, to uh, his constituents. His first job in D.C. was uh, that of a part-time security guard at a Sears and Roebuck. Anybody from D.C.? Located right back in the day, it was in Tenley Circle, right near the, where the container store is located now. On the other side, exactly, exactly. So, you know, um, I really credit my father, who's no longer living, uh, for, you know, making the move. He came to the States quite reluctantly, uh, and I don't think he had much of a choice in terms of whether he was going to see his kids or not. <laughs> um, but so we were very lucky uh, to come to D.C. and, you know, certainly uh, went to the public schools until 11th and 12th grade where I attended a uh, private Catholic military school. At the time, it was not Kuwait. It was awful. Okay, uh, but it was just what the doctor ordered because I needed to have a little bit of more discipline during the school day. Um, and something about religion and military, uh, I guess, provided it. Um, very lucky uh, to uh, you know, have gone on to the University of Pennsylvania. Um, I did play basketball as a kid, and I played at Penn um, and really had a tremendous experience uh, at, uh, at Penn. I will say that the D.C. experience, just growing up in that city, um, you know, certainly has impacted my life, particularly you know, running around playing basketball in all parts of the city. got a chance to see early on you know, um, the, the, the serious disparity uh, in wealth and access and education and resources throughout the city. And uh, that certainly you know, imbued me with a commitment to do all that I possibly could uh, forever uh, to try to elevate people out of, uh, you know, their um, often impoverished states. And so at, at Penn, in addition to playing basketball and going to school, I mentored kids and certainly got involved in all kinds of programs. Uh, the main program was an ABC program, A Better Chance, uh, where it was heavy, intense mentoring and guidance of, of several kids uh, during my f four years. And that's why when I came to law school, I immediately jumped at the opportunity, of course, to participate uh, in the Migrant Farm Workers Clinic. It certainly had a lot of resonance because there were Haitian migrant farm workers. Uh, and uh, that clinic provided just extraordinary resources and made sure that folks got fair wages, uh, that they were uh, living in conditions that were habitable and you know, reasonably decent, uh, that they were able to communicate with family and also have time off. Uh, and so, you know, I saw firsthand how the law could be used uh, as a tool to really help people's lives. And uh, that was uh, an unmistakable uh, experience uh, for me that I've always, always uh, cherished. Um, one thing that Maybe I can still impress upon you all. How many second years are here? Third years? First years? Okay. Probably relates mostly to first and second years. Um, because of my pen experience, you know, I'm, you're working, uh, obviously studying all day, and I had a kind of another job playing basketball, um, and then you know, mentoring and, and whatnot. I felt like, um, to be honest, I didn't really want to be in law school for that time period of, of my life. I wanted to experience other things. I wanted to travel and not be burdened by, you know, a, a coach in practice or a school requirement. Just get out there and learn. And so what I did after my second summer, right, I had summered, I was a summer associate at a law firm in Philadelphia my first summer, and then summered at two law firms in D.C., Covington and Burling and Hogan and Hartson. I lived in the basement of my house, and I just saved all, all my money, and just racking it up. And I, uh, I remember looking at the account in August, about two weeks before school was to start, and I had saved 12000 bucks. And I said, you know, what a waste. I can make this 12000 bucks next year if I want to be a summer associate again. This is my second summer, so I'd rather spend that money, and I'd rather now do what I've always wanted to do, go live abroad. And so I called up uh, the dean uh, and spoke to the dean about the leave of absence policy and this and that, and uh, somehow, some way, I qualified. 
Um, so I worked at one of the firms for another month to make a little bit more money, and I just had the time of my life the next year, uh, the next nine months. I um, ended up living in Paris uh, for five months, and since I had money, I had my own place, right? That was cool. Um, and then, you know, got involved in uh, some civic stuff there. It was quite interesting. Uh, and then went on to Zimbabwe and uh, lived in Zimbabwe uh, for the next three months and certainly got involved in uh, some really interesting, you know, stuff there. I actually coached basketball five teams, uh, four girls' teams, and uh, one uh, boys' teams, uh, boy team. And it's just unbelievable the, the way you get to know people and, you know, those kinds of activities. So I would take a time out and say, look, if you're a first year or even a second year, and perhaps you have not had an opportunity to experience a little bit of life, it's okay to take a time out and go do that. Uh, my mom, of course, was concerned that I might not make it back to law school. Um, I promised her I would. And I remember, I was always pretty good with numbers, uh, and I remember coming back, uh, landed at Dulles Airport. My mom scooped me up, and the first question she asked, and who she was going to ask me, said, hey, how much money do you have? I said, I got a dollar and 57 cents. <laughs> <laughs> and it was a Saturday, and I said, but don't worry about it, Mom, as I'm starting up on Monday at another law firm. <laughs> okay. Uh, and so anyway, graduating class of 89 is fantastic. Why did I work at uh, the Venable Law Firm? And this might be helpful to you as you consider where you might work. Um, you know, I had a great experience summering at so many law firms in D.C. Back in that day, splitting summers was very popular. Uh, and so I actually worked at, my goodness, six firms um, prior to graduating from law school. So I kind of had a sense of, you know, the, the law business, the law game. Um, and someone around, along the way, actually, it was uh, this a wonderful gentleman who was the former Attorney General of the United States, uh, Ben Civiletti. Um, he was Carter's uh, Attorney General, 1978 to 80, an unbelievable man to have a profound impact on my life. Um, ben advised that in matters of work, you must always consider a few factors, most important of which is, are the people who, are, who you're working with invested in your success? Will they give you the most challenging work? Will they push you? And will they have the courage to encourage you to leave the firm to get better experience because it's in your interest, not theirs? Once Ben told me that, I knew I was going to work at Venable, where he was, uh, because I completely and totally trusted him. And I knew that he had my interest um, uh, paramount. And I knew that he knew so much more about the practice of law, the business of law and public service than I did. And sure enough, he delivered. Um, at Venable, I worked as mostly a criminal lawyer, did some civil stuff, um, and I had a chance to work uh, many, many matters with uh, Mr. Civiletti, and as well as other uh, fantastic lawyers. The most significant experience that I had at that firm um, was uh, a death penalty uh, work that uh, we did. I represented a, a gentleman uh, who was incarcerated down here in Virginia, uh, Timothy Bunch, uh, and uh, had a chance to, uh, you know, uh, really work that case for years, really during my entire tenure at Venable. Um, and because of that case, I guess I was a first year there, I was arguing before the Fourth Circuit on a significant constitutional issue, um, and that was fantastic. But I got to tell you, just having the opportunity to meet uh, Mr. Bunch, uh, his family, uh, was extraordinary. Uh, we almost won. Almost isn't good enough in death penalty work. Um, we, um, we lost a two-to-one decision before the Fourth Circuit uh, on a, a suppression issue related to a forced confession. Uh, we uh, sought to petition a rehearing on Bonk. Uh, we were one vote away from getting that, split on ideological lines, total <laughs> political lines. Um, we then went um, really hard and presented a, what I thought was just an extraordinary piece of work uh, requesting clemency from then-Governor Wilder. Um, it's interesting, Governor Wilder's son, a UVA law grad, was my roommate um, back in the day, so I was familiar with the governor. Um, our 
clemency petition was most interesting because in addition to the you know normal stuff about your client's life and progress and this and that, um, we had spent significant time. I'd spent three weeks in California with the victim's family. And uh, sure enough, they got to know our client, and they submitted affidavits uh, and whatnot supporting clemency. And we actually were able to secure a meeting with the governor where the family was going to be point front and center. I said, was going to be, because literally five minutes before the meeting, while we're out there in the governor's reception area, we were told that the governor uh, would uh, changed his mind and was not inclined to meet uh, with us and the family. So our client was executed, uh, in, uh, actually after I left uh, the firm, 1995, December 10. Uh, and uh, that was, again, just an extraordinary experience. The only time I've told a client who's asked me to do something that's legally proper, no. Uh, so Tim wanted me to come on down and be one of the witnesses. And I said, I'm so sorry. That's not something I'm going to do. Um, at any rate, great experience. That experience led me to the Public Defender Service uh, because I saw firsthand uh, what uh, inadequate legal services um, for poor people um, uh, you know, uh, can result in. Tim happened to be uh, a white American from a small town in Indiana, um, but, uh, but if he did not have um, excellent counsel in Virginia. I'll put it that way. Um, at any rate, it's very interesting. It goes right back to a lesson point that Mr. Civiletti um, shared with me. Work with people who care about you and who will always invest in you. Uh, and so sure enough, it was three years at Venable. Uh, I got an unbelievable experience, and I was itching for more, right? You know, you get on a dance floor once a month, you want to dance more than that, right? <laughs> so um, so I, you know, I went to Ben and some others, and I said, look, you know, I think it's time for me to go Get on, uh, get on the uh, trial floor someplace where I'm going to be in court regularly. And uh, to their credit, they recommended the Public Defender Service and U.S. Attorney's Office in the District of Columbia. I was fortunate enough to interview and uh, get, uh, get the offers at both. I chose the Public Defender Service because they had a tradition uh, of extraordinary training um, and experience. Uh, and the other reason why I decided to work there was because um, their lawyers at the Public Defender Service were far more diverse than law firm lawyers. So more women, more women in management, more people of color. And I just thought that would be an extraordinary opportunity uh, to learn from those lawyers. Did that for a while, went back to a great firm, Kacharis and Trainer. Kacharis uh, had a corner of a particular market of legal business. He represented spies. So uh, Plato Kacharis's shop, we did Aldrich Ames and just about every other spy uh, during my three years there. It was fantastic. Um, maybe this is a lesson point for you. So during the pro bono uh, work, death penalty case work that I um, had occasion to do as a first year, second year, and third year at Venable, through that work, I met a gentleman named Chuck Ruff, uh, who was a terrific lawyer. He was then at the uh, Covington and Burling Law Firm. Chuck would uh, later become the U.S. Attorney in D.C., the White House Counsel under President Clinton. And so we shared uh, the death penalty case for a while uh, with, uh, with Chuck. And of course, uh, what happens? I get a phone call while at Kacharis and Trainer from Chuck, Chuck Ruff and his chief deputy, an extraordinarily uh, lawyer, extraordinary lawyer named Cheryl Mills. Uh, and they say, look, you know, we really would like to have you in, you know, interview for a job. And, uh, and that's what I did. And finally got, got hired there. The way the White House works is they'll have you come in for an interview, have you wait for months. Then they'll call you on a Saturday and ask if you can start on Monday. <laughs> um, and uh, that's what happened. And it's just an unbelievable experience there. Um, footnote, because I didn't give enough credit, look at the time, uh, to uh, Cheryl Mills. Cheryl Mills is a lawyer who uh, is a Stanford lawyer, just a brilliant, brilliant lawyer, probably the most, probably the best lawyer I've ever seen um, with respect to Mr. Civiletti. Cheryl came into my life through volunteer work. Uh, she had started, uh, she and her, her uh, partner had started a program in D.C. where they raised some money 
And they literally went out and into, into the community and grabbed a dozen kids who were so-so students around eighth grade mark. Um, and they brought them into George Washington University for the summer, employed the kids, and drilled them in education. And, um, and I was really intrigued by what they were doing, so I volunteered to, you know, to help raise money and to, to be a mentor, and the program was incredibly successful. Um, which is to say that if you are doing something, engaged in activities that you really love, that you're passionate about, you're gonna end up meeting extraordinary people with whom you share a passion and interest. If you, during the course of your association with those extraordinary people, if you bring reliability, consistency, maybe even a little bit of a sense of humor uh, and purpose uh, to those relationships, trust me, opportunities are going to follow. Um, I've also learned, maybe this is a tip, um, from other types of associations. How many of us always volunteer when people ask us to do something, whether we're, we're interested or not? Um, it's the worst thing to do. The worst thing you can do is to volunteer for you know, an organization or an activity that really doesn't mean that much to you. Because guess what? You'll do what I've done in those experiences. You'll go to the first meeting, maybe the second, you're not going to volunteer to do anything special because you don't really think it's that interesting, and you're not going to attend the third, the fourth, or the fifth meeting. What is the impression people are going to have of you? They're going to say that you're not reliable, that you're a decent person, but don't really have a feel for what really matters to that person. Do you think when opportunities come by their desk, they're going to think of you? Chances are they're not. Something Civiletti used to always tell me is that, you know, you have first impressions are so important, and every single day you have an opportunity to make a great first impression, right? Um, and the point really is don't just sign up for organizations unless you're going to be really, really active. When there comes a point, um, as is normal, uh, that the organization and you don't fit, bow out, do it straight up. Um, and people will, again, remember you for the work that you did while you were there, and they'll appreciate the fact that you left when you couldn't devote the time, energy, and creativity to the job. Okay, White House, in a word, was unbelievable, okay? So here's what I did. I was in charge. I was not in charge. Um, I, was, um, I was hired uh, by Chuck and Cheryl. Cheryl uh, was um, in charge, big time, okay? That's just the way she was born. Uh, in charge. Uh, she was in charge of um, a certain level of investigations, um, so serious investigations that concerned the president and the first lady and certain key cabinet officials. Um, so there were 19 associate White House counsel at the White House, uh, and there was a group of investiga investigative lawyers, about six of them, and then there was us. There were three of us. Uh, it was me, Cheryl, and a wonderful guy named Dimitri Neonakis, one of my best friends. And um, so we were the ones who dealt with the investigations that kind of went to the crown jewels. Um, and so, of course, during that time period, it was an investigation literally a day. Uh, and so if you were interested in government investigative work, that, that's where you wanted to be. But I got to tell you, there was a dark side to that. And the dark side was that uh, the political ooh, environment was so, so um, volatile um, at the time that oftentimes lawyers got into the crosshairs. Um, and so a former White House counsel killed himself because of the stress of the job. And so we always knew that we needed to really look out for each other because you know, the, the other party, it was the Republicans, uh, they were making all manner of allegations, accusations against the President and First Lady and uh, high officials, but they had also extend those criticisms to lawyers. I testified before five jury, grand juries. And I got to tell you, you know you're nervous when they ask you your name and you can't get it out, right? I mean, seriously. Um, 
so it was a, it was a very, very um, interesting, but extraordinarily challenging uh, environment. And um, you know, the spirit of camaraderie was, was extraordinary. One thing about Ms. Mills, Cheryl Mills. Cheryl, go back if you're interested. If you're not, go do something else. But if you're interested, go back and look at uh, the impeachment and punch up Cheryl Mills, um, White, uh, Cheryl Mills, Clinton, Senate impeachment. What you'll see is an extraordinary display of advocacy before the Senate in an impeachment trial. Um, by a young lady who was a deputy White House counsel, probably 33 years old at the time, who had never, ever had a trial, prepared a witness, taken a deposition, or even defended herself in traffic court. She, I mean, Clarence Darrow, would have been proud. She took on the, the most serious allegations against the president, you know, the blue dress, the lying, and all that stuff and just did a brilliant job. It's an incredible uh, allocution. Of course, I joke with Cheryl all the time because that was the only time she played the role of a trial lawyer, and she's not done it since. It's <laughs> unbelievable. She has gone on to do great things. She's you know, uh, Secretary Clinton's uh, number one person at the State Department uh, and is uh, continuing to do uh, great things now. Um, at any rate, so that was the White House. I, also at the White House, I should tell you, I uh, had the great fortune of being part of the judicial and cabinet uh, vetting team. Uh, and so, um, you know, we vetted all of the judges, federal judges, as well as D.C. judges uh, and cabinet officials. And for some reason, someone there thought that I was the perfect guy to ask the hard personal questions. <laughs> right? Oh, they're not going to get upset at you. So I had to ask the questions about drug use and nannies and that kind of thing. And the stuff people tell you, it's just crazy. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but anyway, so that was a, a tremendous experience. I, I'll tell you what, as you continue in your career, you should think about how you feel emotionally. It's a big deal. It's a great article a couple of weeks ago about uh, the incidence of uh, alcoholism uh, in the profession. Uh, there is a, um, a very, very high incidence of suicide in our profession. It's because the job itself is stressful. You're kind of handling other people's problems. Then if you couple that with sometimes being in incredibly intense, uh, sometimes not humane environments like law firms where you're you know, billing you know, 17, 18 hours a day and people want you to bill more, uh, you know, things can come off, uh, can become unhinged. So it's really important uh, to uh, associate yourself uh, you know, with people who both in the profession and outside the profession, who you give access to and have a right to tell you to slow it down or take a break or I'm worried about you. You know, last night was fun, but you kind of, you know, were a little um, too exuberant, right? It's a big deal. Um, and so, uh, you know, again, pick your friends carefully uh, and it's always good to have a friend who's going to tell you the truth. Um, I mention that because after I left the White House, and it was not an uncommon experience, certainly for our investigations group, uh, I needed to take a break from the law. I was so lawed out. I started not to believe in our system of you know, adversarial justice because uh, I felt like Congress at the time was really focused in on trying to execute a legal coup d'etat on the President of the United States. So I took a break. I didn't practice law for about 15 months. Um, I got a financial... Uh, advisor license or three or four of them um, because I just wanted to do something that was maybe a little bit less heady and intense. So I got a job, uh, the great firm UBS hired me. Uh, it was the worst job in the world. Um, I, I was never more bored in my life. You know, 9.15 a.m. couldn't come soon enough. I'd go for the coffee. Market opens at 9.30. Right? By 4 o'clock, everybody's out of there. I was just miserable. My colleagues, you know, with respect, some of them are really good friends now, um, they were not of the same broad caliber um, as folks at UVA Law. I don't want to be snob snobby or anything like that. Uh, but they just were not, I didn't learn anything. Uh, and so I needed to get the hell out of there because I felt as though my brain was atrophying. 
Um, and so sure enough, you know, I got back to, got on a, the Venable train, uh, called up Ben and some other people, got right back uh, to the Venable law firm. And great experiences there, good practice, became managing partner. Uh, that was almost uh, akin to the experience I had when I came down to UVA my first day. A black managing partner in America, even my own conference rooms, I was the only black guy, <laughs> right? That changed, <laughs> believe me. <laughs> um, but, um, but yeah, it was an unbelievable experience, and they, they really gave me uh, the opportunity of a lifetime to lead. Um, so anyway, did all that. That was great. All of a sudden, there's an opportunity that comes about to run for office in the District of Columbia. I'd been kind of an armchair guy criticizing politicians, right, in the back. Oh, they suck. Corrupt, <laughs> corruption, <laughs> right? Oh, he's unimpressive, <laughs> right? So I decided, look, you know, I kind of had this in me for years that if something came about, you know, it was the right opportunity, I'd go ahead and, you know, uh, devote the time, energy, and resource to run because, you know, it's one thing to criticize from the banana section. It's another thing to get in the arena and try to do something different. Uh, and so sure enough, the Office of Attorney General of the District of Columbia uh, came open in a way. Um, what happened was the residents of the District of Columbia um, had passed an initiative, 76% of the residents of the District of Columbia wanted to have an elected attorney general. Part of this was because of corruption stuff going on in D.C. 43 other states have elected attorney general. The thought was that an independent elected attorney general, accountable to the people, would be a significant check and balance on the executive branch and indeed the council of the District of Columbia. Um, you know what happens when the people pass a referendum? Do you think politicians get behind it? No. So the council of the District of Columbia and the mayor of the District of Columbia intentionally slow walked this thing, then filed a lawsuit to prevent an election on the date in which the referendum required it. So these politicians, supposedly representing the, the public's interest, they tried to stop the election of an attorney general. They tried to postpone it to 2018. Uh, so a lawsuit, uh, you know, followed, and you know, finally, in June of 2014, uh, the D.C. Court of Appeals, the High Court in D.C., declared that the race shall go on, and it shall occur on November. Um, and so I got in the race. Um, four other really, really talented people, interesting backgrounds, and whatnot, uh, and um, and I got in the race because I really wanted to focus on being an elected official who at least tried every day to do the right thing, um, really focus on juvenile justice reform, number one, elevate uh, the office's general game, if you will, practice at a higher level, um, three, uh, develop and build just a robust consumer protection office, and then really focus on bringing creative lawsuits that enhance uh, poor and vulnerable citizens, uh, residents of the District of Columbia. So I uh, got in, um, poured a lot of my own money in there. That was a change. Uh, I really enjoyed that um, because, candidly, in D.C., not unlike other places, it can be towns and can be cities and can be states, there's just a core group of contributors, supporters, not bad people, um, but they kind of decide who's going into office. And um, I'm not impressed with the people who they generally select. Uh, and so it was a really, really advantageous to be able to tell a prospective donor that I wasn't interested in the contribution. Um, if you wanted to come and knock on doors with me, that would be quite helpful. I can give you times where I'll be and this and that. And so it's been a very, very good advantage. Um, and I've never thought about acting in a certain way or not acting in a certain way, um, you know, because of a political contribution. That way, I love Donald Trump. I do not. <laughs> no, but some of what he's saying on that, uh, you know, that whole front is absolutely correct. Um, at any rate, so we get elected. That's great. And, and that's the kind of stuff we're focused on. And I'll stop. Juvenile justice reform is a huge thing for us in the District of Columbia. We had a practice in D.C. that uh, had been going on for decades, even when I was a public defender, of shackling every juvenile who came into court. Um, and so uh, we went about and 
a month and change that policy with the uh, cooperation of the, uh, the chief judge of the Superior Court. Uh, we're doing really good things, I think, in the area of stopping kids from coming into the juvenile justice system by aggressively providing you know, really great services to these kids to get them on the right path. I mean, times are really hard uh, in the lives of young kids in communities in the District of Columbia. Uh, and the truth of the matter is it's usually no or little fault of their own. They don't have um, enough responsible adults in their lives. The responsible adults in their lives are oftentimes you know, suffering from extreme uh, trauma, uh, substance abuse, alcohol abuse, lack of education, poverty. So these kids, you know, they just get into packs and they make bad decisions. Uh, and so uh, working with uh, agencies in the government, we've been able to divert um, kids by a factor of eight times more than kids had been diverted the last four years. We did that last year. 91% of the kids who we have diverted have completed uh, the uh, diversion services. 92% of those kids have not been rearrested in the last 14 months. So uh, I'm here to say that you know, government can do good. Uh, focused services can really help kids who have shown a propensity to make a bad decision understand that, you know, my God, there are better rewards for good decisions. Um, so I'll stop there and take uh, any question you want. Look, thank you so much for indulging me. Um, and uh, the floor is yours.